We are very grateful for her today to present and co-present with Ty Hunter. Uh, Ty Hunter, if you guys did not join us last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, was also with us for water safety. Uh, he was born and raised in Plain City, Utah, uh, and a graduate of Weber High School. He obtained a Bachelor of Science in Recreation Resources Management at Utah State University in 1997. Uh, he started his career with the Utah Division of Parks and Recreation in December of 1997 and as a park ranger at Willard Bay State Park. Uh, he was promoted in October 2002 as the Assistant Manager at Yuba State Park. In June of 2003, he became the Park Manager at Utah Lake State Park. And after 10 years of service as a Park Manager, he was promoted to his current position as the Boating Program Manager, um, as the Boating Program Manager of the Utah Division of Parks and Recreation and Boating Law Administrator for the State of Utah. Um, over his 22-year career, he has observed many water-related incidents that resulted in the loss of life. Um, he's interacted with many families and seen the hurt that the loss of a loved one causes. Uh, this is why he's so passionate about water and boating safety and hopes during his efforts to portray life jacket safety that at least one life can be saved and their family will not need to experience loss. When he's not at work, he enjoys being with his family, participating in a variety of outdoor activities, playing games, and tinkering around the house. Um, so just talking with you guys again, today is the June 4th, or the July 14th. Um, we also have the upcoming motorcycle and boat safety. Um, so please join us for those. Um, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at U of U Trauma, and those, are all, those will also be listed there so you can see those. Um, so contact hours, for those of you that want contact hours, you just need to attend and participate in the, in the participation. Um, you get one hour of contact, one hour of the contact hours, uh, and then you can use that for your professional licensing. Ty and Lisa are going to be kind of just co going back and forth, talking together. They've collaborated together on this presentation, so we're excited to now turn the time over to them. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of start off a little bit throwing some some statistics out. Back in 2019, a lot of these just basically go from, they do the federal fiscal year. So it's October 1 to September 30th of each year. So 2019 statistics, which includes, these are boating statistics, uh, which is, includes the loss of life of a, or, or a missing person, um, treatment beyond first aid, uh, property damage that exceeds uh, $2,000 uh, or more, total loss of a vessel. And then out of this, um, we had 112 reportable incidents. Um, in a lot of the statistics and everything else they put out there, they say accidents. Uh, my, my position as a boating law administrator, I have 56 other uh, basically co-boating law administrators in, in the state, uh, in the 50 states, in the six territories. And we're really trying to move this from accidents to incidents or casualties one way or another. We're trying to get something there because accidents is, uh, you hear the word accident and you think this is something that, that was unavoidable. And, and most of these incidences were, uh, were avoidable, as, as you'll see as we go through here. But as, as I said, just to go down, we had 78 injured persons, 69 damaged vessels, nine fatalities, seven of which were drowning. And then uh, six of those seven could have been prevented if they, if they would have worn a life jacket. Life jackets themselves, uh, they can increase your chance of survival up to 80%. Uh, some of the statistics, uh, as I said last year, uh, seven out of our 10 fatalities uh, were, current, were not wearing life jackets. And this current year, seven out of eight were not wearing uh, life jackets. The simple act of wearing a life jacket uh, could, could have prevented the outcome of, of a fatality in this respect. Um, over the last three years, Utah um, averages about 80% of people that were involved in a fatality, could have, it could have been provided, uh, prevented uh, by wearing a life jacket. May 6th, uh, we had two females on Utah Lake uh, floating on pool rafts with no life jackets. Uh, both of them drowned. May 15th, we had a male at Quail Creek, Res uh, Quail Creek State Park uh, fishing from a kayak with no life jacket and drowned. May 31st, a male on uh, Lake Powell left the boat voluntarily without a life jacket and again drowned. The 7th of June, a male on Lake Powell uh, left the boat voluntarily to assist another and uh, without a life jacket and, and drowned. May 14th, uh, a male at, Utah, U, at Yuba Lake State Park riding a personal watercraft without a life jacket. And then uh, last one, uh, just last week, July 8th, a male at Deer Creek State Park uh, left a boat voluntarily to regain his hat and drown. Could have been prevented very easily by wearing a life jacket. And Ty, let me just um, interject here. 
uh, I went to Flaming Gorge over the weekend and I was looking around to see who was wearing their life jackets. And I'd say most people did, but there were a few that did not. But as I was talking to somebody as we were waiting for um, the boats to get back on the water, or rather for everybody to get there so that we could go down on the raft. Um, there was somebody who was just sitting there without her life jacket. And I said, oh, are you gonna wear your jacket? And she said, oh, I don't know, should I? And I, I talked to her, I said, well, we had this big push about seatbelt in the 70s and 80s. And so now everybody wears a seatbelt. And then we had a big push on helmets for biking. And so now everybody wears their helmets. You know, you when you look at somebody who doesn't have a helmet, you're like, why don't you have your helmet? And so and now it's the same thing about life jackets. You know, people are still like, oh, it's uncomfortable. I really don't want to wear it. I, I can't get a very good tan when I have a life jacket on. But it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's, um, you know, life jackets save lives, just like seat belts, just like bike helmets life jackets save lives. They're the seat belts of the sea, if we wanted to put it in a little bit of a rhyme there um, with that. So if we have up is take a boating education course. Um, on top of wearing a life jacket, you'll learn a little bit more about a life jacket, how to properly fit a life jacket. Um, that's a little bit harder in a Zoom situation to where you can't have everybody all kind of trying on a life jacket and try different sizes and see how they really properly fit. Um, but that that's again that could be almost a, a whole course in itself just trying to get the the right fit and the many different types of jackets that are out there but um you can go ahead and learn more about navigation um, about carbon monoxide poisoning propeller injuries about being a good steward while you're out on the water and then weather utah only has one mandatory uh education course that is that is required here for us and that is with personal watercraft operators from the ages of 12 to 18. Anybody else operating a, a, a traditional motorboat, they're not required to take an education course. And so we're just trying at this point in time, um, either until we get legislative support to be able to make that mandatory for everybody who's operating a vessel to uh, obtain a, 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 you know, take an, edu an education course and obtain a certificate um, to take one voluntarily and to do something for themselves and for their families. We wanted to just kind of let you know what kind of things that you could do to um, prevent, you know, boating accidents. And so it's a good idea to have a boat safety kit. So anytime that you go out on a boat, these are things that are really good to have. So your flashlight, duct tape, bucket, first aid kit, whistle, ropes, mirror, garbage bags, fire extinguisher and life jackets. And um, not just any life jacket, but a life jacket that is approved and that fits correctly. Yeah, yes, and, and a lot of those, depending on the size of boat that you have, they are required by law to be on board. That's just some things to know. Um, one of the things that I, I don't have put up on the, the slide here, but if people, if you can remember and try to write this down, I'll say it slowly, uh, you can actually do a, a self-inspection of your vessel, of your boat, from an online form. Uh, you can find that form at boating.utah.gov. That's boating, B-O-A-T-I-N-G, .utah.gov. So on this slide, uh, navigation laws. This is one of the items that it, it, is it is specific to Utah. Other states have similar laws, but the distances may not be exactly the same. Um, a portion of our navigation laws, many of the navigation laws there, if you start to think about why do we drive on the right side of the road? Why, you know, why do we do certain things here? This all basically came from the water. Our, our laws that we, when we operate our motor vehicles, in the most part, came from the water. Uh, when you give right away to the, to the vehicle on the right, you give right away to the vessel on the right. And that's kind of where it all kind of came because that was, you know, in, in the most part, that's where our congested uh, travel and, and congested areas were in ports, marinas um, around the world. And so these navigation laws came from there. But one of the items that we wanted to focus on was the speed and proximity rule. And that is to be able to be, in a, be at a wakeless speed, so not creating a wake at all, uh, when you're within 150 feet of another vessel, a person floating in the water, a water skier being towed by another boat, a water skier that has been towed, a shore fisherman, uh, some, a launch ramp, a dock, and a designated swim area. Stay away from these areas. Uh, leave this, this, this safety buffer of 150 feet to reduce a collision. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that uh, we could really avoid a lot of our collision type accidents and, and heavy trauma 
injuries that occur uh, if, if people would take and pay more attention to this? One of the reasons why I offered to um, help um, with this presentation was because I've gone on a lot of calls with Air Med that have to do with boating accidents. And so I just felt like there were some stories that I wanted to bring in on. I do have a case where I went on, um, it was up in Bear Lake, or I think it was a year ago. It was uh, two personal watercrafts um, came together and they hit each other. Uh, he was thrown into the water, um, he was brought out, but his injuries um, were uh, a lot of chest um, injury. So he had some chest trauma. When they got him out of the water, he had some difficulty breathing and some um, lightheadedness, it seemed like. But uh, what I remember when they called us, so he, the first thing I remember, he was awake, he was talking, he was, uh, you know, remembered the accident. But the thing that I remember the most was that he was really pale. You know, what we don't know, all we can see is, you know, the outside of him. And so when you see somebody who's talking and who's you know, remember the accident, you wonder, you know, well, how serious of his injuries are, but we don't know what's going on on the inside of his body. Uh, what he was doing was he was had some internal bleeding. And the thing that was clued in to me was the fact that he was so pale. Uh, if you were to take his vital signs, he had a high heart rate also. But other than that, he had normal vital signs. We were able to quickly get him to the hospital um, in route I do remember uh, giving him some pain medication because he did have some fractured ribs and and then it dropped his blood pressure a little bit and so I had to give him a fluid bowl. So I didn't, we weren't carrying blood at the time, but that's what this patient needed. He needed a quick transport to a trauma center and he needed blood and then he needed to go to surgery. He had a, a liver laceration. And so things that um, you know can clue you in because you don't always know on the outside what uh, the injuries are are um, you know, looking at that skin color. And we'll cover some more things at the very end of the slide of what you will wanna do, but I just wanted to go through that and just kinda of let you know that those kind of things can happen. This is a call that I went on, this was back in 2013. And this is the boat that this in incident happened on. And as you can see, on um, the back of the boat, there's that little ramp and then you can see on in the back of the boat, you can see the type of exhaust that he has. So this patient, he was a 22 year old male and we were called to Bear Lake again. And uh, as we arrived, we were, we didn't know exactly all we get when we get the call is, you know, an age and, you know, maybe a possible injury, but uh, he was unresponsive. So uh, he had been out on the boat skiing all day with his friends and they were wakeboarding and tubing, and he didn't really want to participate in that, but he was happy to help with getting them in and out of the boat. So he was on the back of that boat, helping them get in and out. He was also, everybody was having a good time, and there was some drinking involved, but um, it was all day long. During um, part of the day, his friends kind of noticed that he said he didn't feel very good. He kind of felt nauseous. And so he kind of came into the boat. And then the next thing they know, they look over at him and he is um, unresponsive. So they were in the middle of the boat, or sorry, they were in the middle of the lake. They see he's unresponsive. They start, you know, doing CPR on him. And then they were able to call in for us. So once we got there, he'd been, he had gotten to the shore. They pulled him aboard. We land right there at the dock and there's everybody was there watching and people are doing they're doing CPR on him and so we go through our protocols and you know, we get the airway we you know give epi and um, we're not getting a pulse back and I'm thinking you know he's a 23 year old healthy male what could possibly cause this patient to go into cardiac arrest you know and, and we weren't sure exactly he didn't have any injuries he hadn't gotten into the boat or into the water and, and um, the sad thing is is that we were not able to save him um, despite everything we did um, we had to call the code at that time we weren't sure but um, we were able to get um, some feedback from an autopsy and it was confirmed that he died of carbon monoxide and you know when you think about it you're thinking carbon monoxide poisoning you know an enclosed space but you're in the middle of the lake and it is not an enclosed space. You know, how can you really get carbon monoxide? But you can because it was, you know, circulated. He was in the back of the boat. 
And so it's very, it's important to know that you can get carbon monoxide poisoning even when you are in the open water. Yes. And this, this one to kind of play off on with this one here is this is, this is very common. This uh, style of boat uh, where the exhaust dumps underneath the swim deck, most of the people that have been out uh, on lakes with these boats uh, are going to get some, get either a, a small exposure or a significant exposure of carbon monoxide um, from being on the swim deck there. Um, in the state of Utah, uh, actually before this incident, uh, it dealt with uh, about eight years before this incident, uh, the state of Utah created a, uh, a couple of administrative rules um, that require all operators to uh, not idle or operate their boat or idle their engine when someone is holding on to the boat's swim platform, the deck, the steps, or the ladder, or when somebody's being towed in a non-standing position within 20 feet of the boat. This is just the plain and simply standing back on the swim deck. Uh, if there's no reason to have the motor running, turn it off. If somebody's entering in the water, turn the boat off or, or exiting from the water, turn the boat off. Depending on the concentration when they come into that area, um, it could be their exposure could be significant enough to, to cause poisoning in there to, to render them unconscious or unresponsive. Um, this year, we have had uh, two incidences, one on Utah Lake and the other one on Willard Bay, uh, dealing with children. Again, uh, the, the motor was being ran to keep the boat. They didn't, uh, their battery wasn't working all that well, so they didn't want to shut their boat off. They were, everybody was all swimming around the back of the boat, and a couple of these kids became uh, exposed to carbon monoxide. And I know of one of the follow-ups, one of them had to go into a hyperbaric chamber um, for treatment. So that's just something these uh, day and age now, this open water, we just need to be careful with it. Propeller injuries. They can be very serious, but they um, they look a little bit more gruesome than they really are. They don't have a lot of bleeding involved, but they look pretty gruesome. So on August uh, 2012, there was a 13-year-old female that fell off the back of a platform on a boat. She was helping her family, um, you know, with the ropes and while they were tubing, and she got tangled in the ropes and fell into the water and. Um, the propeller got to her and cut her up pretty good. Those were some deep stitches that they had to repair on her. She suffered fatal injuries, so she didn't live. It, this picture is not her injury, but these are what a, a propeller injuries look like. But this girl, she suffered fatal injuries, um, even though family tried to save her, and so she died on scene. So very sad deal. These happen way too more than what they need to be. Um, as, as it's kind of been in here, it's, it's responsibility of the operator, but it's also the responsibility of everybody that is on the boat, that when that boat is running, um, to communicate to the operator when anybody is going into the water. We've had several incidences where that communication's not occurred. The operator's trying to make sure that they don't get, you know, they're in a congested area. Somebody's like, oh, I'm too hot. I want to jump off and, and, and do things now. The operator doesn't know they're off. They put the, reverse, the the boat in reverse and back up over top of one of their occupants. They don't even know it's in the water. So everybody needs to be responsible for everybody else on the boat um, and communicate that to the operator so they know what's going on. And then uh, last of all, uh, on this last bullet is wear an engine cutoff switch. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever seen a runaway boat uh, without an operator on it. If you haven't, go to YouTube. You can see it. You will understand when I talk about and say things about the circle of death. Um, engine cutoff switches, if a boat is equipped with one, wear one. A lot of these tiller driven outboard, you know, small boats with outboards that are kind of tiller steered, um, the, those boats, they have a little lantern that's that little red curly cue kind of cord. Snap that on to you because if you were to somehow fall off the boat while that motor is running, um, you can hit a wake and, and fall off. That boat will start to spin and, and it can come back and get you several times. So please wear that and, and, and be careful with them. One of the other things in an education course is that we'll get is we'll learn about stewardship. Uh, one of the things that's kind of hot in the state of Utah right now is, um, and it's because it's one of the more prominent boats that we see out, are wakeboard boats. Um, we, we kind of refer to them as these, these water plows. They, they're in the water, they, they have a tremendous amount of, of, of ballast that's onboard water that they pump on board with them. And they really just want to just 
act like an old mold, mold, mold board plow um, and be able to roll that water off to the side and make a great, uh, great wake that somebody can surf on or, or they can board and get awesome air off of. And with this, with these large wakes that they're, that they're creating, we are asking, and this is not a, this is the, the state of Utah. These are other Marine patrol agencies and also the water sports industry association is asking um, all operators of these types of boats to wake responsibly. First of, first of all is to keep a minimum of 200 feet. So they want to extend it further than what our actual law is and to boat uh, and stay at least 200 feet away to let that wake kind of dissipate. dissipate. Um, another one and uh, is to keep the music down. Most of these towers that are on these boats are outlined with speaker systems and stuff all over on these boats that is, uh, it's pretty, pretty uh, crazy. Um, how loud and sound carries a long ways on the water. So keep your music under reasonable levels. Uh, not everybody likes the song that you like. And uh, let's, let's uh, all play in a sound, sandbox uh, well with one another. And then the last one is, is to minimize uh, repetitive, repetitive passes. Um, this is to minimize the amount of wakes that are hitting a particular area. Um, I know this is really tough because it is popular to kind of start to amplify some of these wakes and you can get some, some really large wakes if you make repetitive passes. But if we can minimize that, it makes it to where everybody can kind of have an enjoyable time out on the lake. Well, let's pop on to the next one. Lisa. Okay, um, great. So um, be aware of weather conditions. Uh, this is another case. Um, uh, this picture is taken at Bear Lake. Uh, the reason why I've gone to Bear Lake on a lot of these is because of the bases that I work at is this closest base. It's in um, Davis Hospital. We get called to Bear Lake all the time. And so I just happened to work at the Davis base a lot. And so I've gone to Bear Lake for a lot of these calls, but um, I was not on this call, but my coworkers were. So in June, 2015, um, a family was boating on Bear Lake when a storm came up. There, the storm had about 70 mile per hour winds. And if you've ever been to Bear Lake, you and experienced that. And these wind bursts just come up out of nowhere, out of you know a beautiful day. And uh, the waves were reported to be white capped and six feet high. Their boat had capsized and all were in the water for about three hours. With the, the temperature, the Bear Lake temperatures can be um, about, you know, can be, it's a cold, it's a cold lake. So it was about 53 degrees. Uh, the father who was a doctor and um, there were two daughters and a family friend who died. So they were in the water for a long time. Airmed was called to come rescue them. They were in the middle of the lake. So it was really difficult to get to the rescue to get to them. And so when they did get to them, they know, knew that some of them didn't make it, but with the kids in cold water drowning, you know, there's a chance that they can still be able to do some measures to help them because if it's a cold water drowning, you know, they could warm them up they can put them on what's called ECMO. And so um, to give them every possible chance, they flew those girls to primary children's. And unfortunately, because they were so cold and in the water for so long, they were not able to be put on ECMO and they um, had to pronounce them. But um, the things that we don't always know about um, is that the reason why they weren't able to put them on ECMO is that they know with the chance of survivability, um, they check their potassium levels. And if their potassium level is too high, um, and their potassium level would be high because their their cells have ruptured, then the chance of survivable survivability is not great if it's greater than 10. And theirs was high enough. So with 10 for adults and 12 for kids, and theirs was too high. To, and so that's why they didn't put them on the ECMO. But um, it's just so important to make sure that you know that these conditions can happen and to check the weather to, you know, if you're gonna be there all day, check the weather to see if there's gonna be any chance of storms that come up. Yes, this, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna go through what, um, you know, check the weather forecast, have a plan, and be sure someone on the shore knows where you are. Yes. 
So to add a little bit onto this story with this is, is that these, this, all the occupants of this boat, they made great decisions at the point that it turned into an emergency. They all had their life jackets on. They did all the right things at that point in time. But, and, and this sounds really bad to go in and try to do, to do kind of an armchair quarterback with this is, it's the decisions that led up to the emergency that maybe were not the most correct one. Um, let's, let's try a couple more passes. Or instead of saying, staying at one end of the lake in a safe area, they decided to go back and try to retrieve their boat back onto a trailer and to make it across that lake in those conditions. And that boat is not made uh, for, those, for the, that, those types of conditions there. So that's where it kind of it, it plays into. This is one that uh, they did everything right. They had their life jackets done. They were wearing them. Everything was great. But it just, again, three hours in that cold water, it just did not, did not go. And that's where from last, last presentation, when I talked about the 110 one rule, um, this this played out to the to the one hour uh, mark and maybe even a little bit longer than that, but it it just didn't uh, didn't work out in their favor and it's it's just sad. This one's this one was a heartbreaking one and just decimated a, a, a local family in an area where I where I kind of grew up and it's uh, just was a sad situation. Take over that one ten rule again. Uh, yes, yeah, so just to kind of go over this one and this this is set. Um, as, as kind of an average of what occurs um, for 45 degree water temperatures, um, the average person will have about one minute of that cold, cold water shock where, they'll, where they will hyperventilate um, this uncontrolled breathing. Um, and then the 10 minutes, again, in that 45 degree water temperature, the average person will have about 10 minutes of worthwhile movement that they can get themselves um, either out of the boat or to some place of sa some place safe, and then um, again, then then we have an hour until they succumb to the severe effects of hypothermia and unconsciousness that can occur. Um, and like I said, as the water temperature goes up, those those periods of time can be extended a little bit further out. But all of that 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 kind of rule of thumb, the one ten one rule of thumb there. Um, it, it all hinges on somebody wearing their life jacket for, for that to occur. Um, without a life jacket, you're going to be lucky to make it if past a couple of minutes. Okay, you think that this would be a no-brainer, <laughs> but um, drugs and alcohol are very common in boating accidents. So, uh, 2012, on June 30th in 2012, I was called to go to uh, East Canyon Reservoir for a 50-year-old male that was involved in a boating accident. So what had happened was he and his friends, they had been boating, they had been drinking. Uh, he fell off the back of the boat into the water, and as the driver circled around to come get him, uh, he was trying to get close to him, and he hit him at the chest with the bow at the front of the boat. And then as the boat went by, then the propeller got to him. So this picture right here is not him because I don't take pictures of my patients, <laughs> but it was a, a picture. So he had marks like that. And so he had propeller marks that were on his shoulder and his armpit all the way down. And he also had some on his leg. Uh, he was awake. And so they, they put him into the boat and they drove to the, boat dock and obviously they called us. I was working Park City that day. We got there really quick. And so I was like, we got there, they were pulling him out of the boat. Um, there were a lot of people around. I remember there was somebody who was a nurse and, and she said he has um, a flail chest because you know his breathing was paradoxical. And uh, he was awake and he was talking to me. And so looking at him and looking at his injuries, and I had to make the split decision, you know, do I stay and do things? Um, I have procedures I can do. I can put an airway in. I can do a chest tube. I can do all these things. Um, I'm seven minutes away from a trauma center. Or do I, you know, put him in the helicopter and just go and get him to trauma center as fast as possible? 
And so doing some of those things um, while you're there kind of take, can take some time. And so my split decision was I'm going to put them in the helicopter and we're going to go and I'm going to do some of those procedures en route in my seven minute flight, which was really crazy. Um, so did um, needled his chest because he had, um, he didn't have breast sounds on one side and he had a collapsed lung on the one side and gave him oxygen. He was awake for me the whole time. We get him to the trauma center and um, in the trauma room, you have a lot of people there. You got your trauma surgeons, your trauma doctors, your ER doctors, and you just have a lot of people. And I just remember one of the residents asked me, well, why didn't you intubate him on scene? You can. And I said, yeah, I can. But I know that it would have been a lot faster for me to get him to the hospital if I were to just, you know, grab him and go. And so he um, got intubated in the ER. He went to surgery, um, did some follow-up on him, and he had... He had uh, some of his in injuries were, so he had the sternum fracture, he had a broken mandible, broken teeth and nose. He had, um, let's see, um, when he went to surgery, then he was in a long care, um, extended care facility for a long time, just recovering. And I'm not sure what happened after that, but I just know that he didn't go home for a long time and just um, had to recover for a long time, a lot of injuries. Uh, another example of something of voting under the influence was, and this is um, up where I live, or I live in um, Huntsville, near Pine Ridge Reservoir, if anybody knows. But this one involved a University of Utah scientist, and this was back on August 11th, um, 2011. And she was uh, training, she was doing some open water swimming, and she was training for um, an Ironman. And it was in the evening, and she was swimming in an area uh, and since then, they've created a, a, an open swim area because so that it's safer. But she was swimming in an area where it was an arm, uh, I don't know, like an area that had some houses around it. And so this, these uh, boaters were, um, you know, partying. And they went by and they said they didn't realize it, uh, that they had hit her. But, um, you know, things have come out since then. and. Uh, Anyway, so the propeller um, cut her, and so when she was in the water, she's yelling for help, and one of the people whose houses are nearby, he heard her, and so he went out to the shore, he went and got into a boat and rowed out to her, and could see that she was, you know, bleeding profusely, and she was talking at this point, but as he was trying to get her into the boat and rescue her, um, she passed away. Uh, they were able to um, track down those people and that were involved, and they did get um, uh, some. They get they got sentenced and sent to jail. So um, this can it's just you know very sad when you hear these cases of things, but it's you know pretty common to have people who are just having a good time on the lake. But there can be you know bad decisions made under the influence of alcohol and drugs. Thanks, Lisa. With that, um, let's let's advance to the next to the next slide. Um, I'll just go over some statistics. Uh, some of you may have seen some of these things on the news. Um, this year was a, a little bit baffling. Um, give you a little bit about Operation Dry Water. Operation Dry Water is a it's kind of a year round uh, boating under the influence uh, campaign. But uh, once a year, they do a heightened awareness time, and this year it found over it, it, it landed on the uh, weekend of the Fourth of July. So the third, fourth, and fifth, uh, Utah participated in this heightened heightened uh, time um, for detection of budding under the influence. And uh, these are our results from. Uh, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four four locations across the state. So we, we contacted 3,100 people. Um, and then here's the crazy one, only five DUIs. Uh, but if you go further down, we had 25 possessions of marijuana and then 26 of the, the drug paraphernalia. Uh, there were a few things kind of left off this. We had one acid and, and then one other controlled substance that uh, was, was found. And this is just really crazy to see that our that our alcohol involved uh, violations are dwarfed by 
by um, recreational or you want to call it uh, that uh, illegal drugs um, and and we are starting to see this in the field that uh, we're seeing a lot more more mar possession of marijuana citations operators that are under influence of, of marijuana or a mix of alcohol and marijuana together um, and even pills as as we see them out there so um, please, everybody, if we can, uh, just let's just make sure that we stay away, uh, keep ourselves uh, sober and aware and, and understand that when you are out on the water, there are many stressors that can occur out there that can impair you even though you're not um, um, partaking of any of, of any of these illegal, uh, you know, substances or, or alcohol and being, being over the limit. And some of that can be the glare from the sun. Um, the wave action, the heat, um, that can all stress your body in one way or another and can impair you. And I can speak from experience that spending 20 something plus hours on a boat on a given day with the rescue and exhaust fumes and heat and everything there, I'm tired. And it's very hard to make the decision. And a lot of times uh, when we have these circumstances like this, we, we go into a mandatory phase that uh, nobody can drive. They've got a crash in their truck get a couple of good hours underneath their belt before they can try to go home, even though it may be just a, a, you know, 20, 30 minutes away from, from home. We just don't want to cause anything there. And then the other thing too, is if you ha have uh, a designated operator um, and you are partaking of, a, of alcohol while you're out on a boat, um, how did you get to the lake? That's one of the things that we need to make sure that people ask themselves that if you are going to drink alcohol, that how did you get to the lake and how are you going to get home? Um, so that's, that's just all that, that uh, circumstances you need to put in there. And in the state of Utah, basically, if you can drive it, you can get a DUI. Um, the, the laws on the road with, with driving under the influence are the same as they are on the water. They are the same as they are on the trails with ATVs. So please, uh, please be careful and, and don't uh, drink and vote. Okay, so injury management. Uh, most important thing is call for help. Get that help going right away. Uh, if you happen to be in a very remote location, you know, you can call for a helicopter. <laughs> you know, people don't realize that personal people can call for a helicopter. But um, call 911, that's the most important call to make. So with your patient, you want to be checking, you know, do your basic check, your BLS check. You want to check for ABCs. Are they breathing? You know, do they have um, in, an open an airway and circulation? Do they have a pulse? And so those are all just your simple checks, making sure that you have all those things. You want to stop the bleed. Um, I have been involved in the Stop the Bleed campaign and teaching people um, about stopping the bleed. And it's so basic, but it's so important and it can save lives. So you want to apply direct pressure. If you have your own personal safety kit, you know, you can have these tourniquets. And, you know, the whole thing about having a tourniquet on for a long period of time is worse than not having a tourniquet. No, that's not true. Um, I would, you know, really encourage everyone to have a personal safety kit and um, they should have tourniquets in their kit. Next thing is that if they've had any kind of boating injury, most likely they might have also possible spinal injuries. And so you want to make sure that you are maintaining those spinal precautions. So, you know, getting them out of the boat, you would have somebody holding on to their head and their neck and just like keeping their spine as straight as possible. And then, you know, on the ground and just maintaining that. Sometimes patients, if they've had a head injury, they might be a little combative and confused and you might need to have somebody staying there at the head and telling them and reminding them, okay, I just need you to hold still and I need you to hold still. You need to check them for shock because that's gonna be something that's gonna kill them. So these are all things that um, are that could possibly kill them before help gets there. So you wanna check for shock. You want to keep the patient warm. You would wanna cover them with a blanket. If you've noticed that they're really pale, you could put their feet or their head, you know, their feet up a little tiny butt. Um, but the things that's going to make sure that, you know, by stopping the bleeding, that's going to help. But um, the things that are going to make them um, 
you know, that's going to save their life is the most important thing is that, you know, your ABCs. And so, um, and then calling for help early. Does anyone have any questions on this that they would like to ask at this point? I actually do have a question. Um, when you were talking about a uh, call for a helicopter, is that generally just directly to 911 or is there, if, if you have access, I mean, if you call 911, you just need to identify that, hey, this, we're in a remote area, we need a helicopter. Is that the way that you actually handle that? Yes, so depending on the area that you're in, it would go to that dispatch center. So let's say you are in uh, Weaver County, um, there is a, dispatch center and they there are three helicopters in the Weaver County area and so you can call 911 and say I need a helicopter and they can you know whoever is up on the first up on that dispatch can you know be notified so then that 911 would call our air med dispatch center and they would let us know that way there are um, some areas that are so remote that you um, that we have had calls from people directly that you know have called air med directly and so that is something that we respond on too um, I have a instance where my son actually uh, was injured in Morgan and um, he was working on a farm with a, a paramedic that used to work with us and my son had fallen down um, some wooden steps 10 wooden steps about 40 feet and had a severe head injury and so he directly called air med and said send a helicopter and so when we get these phone calls we just go a lot of times um, sometimes maybe uh, somebody will come on scene and decide no this is not helicopter worthy and we'll, they'll cancel us and that's totally fine and we're like always happy to get in the helicopter and fly and so if we're not needed we're not needed that's no big deal and so if you're in a remote area and you think that it's really serious call 911 or directly call a helicopter that one's up to you know it's up to you it works. Either one works. Yeah, and Lisa, I'm going to add to that. I think every um, person who works for a flight team that we've asked. I, I wanted to put one thing in there too with this is, is with this and calling in, especially like 911, uh, if you are in an area where your signal can be triangulated, we can get a GPS location that will actually help uh, every responding agency um, and person to know where you are at and where the actual location is because that's, that's very helpful. So um, yeah, call and it's the best thing when you can say, oh, I don't have to go and there's no paperwork. It's awesome. I have to tell you another fun story. I went on um, a call and it was a river rafting trip and it was on the green. We didn't have an exact location and I just remember as we were flying in the canyon above the river and you'd see all these people who are on rafts and they're just waving at us and we're like is that our patient is that our patient are they waving at us because they're wanting us to come down or are they just saying hi <laughs> but it was a really exciting fun call for us we we love those kind of calls we did find the patient um she was somebody who was having some svt and um, just transported her to the local um, hospital, not necessarily a trauma center, but um, that one was really fun. So yeah, we never know what kind of calls we're gonna go on and uh, we have to be prepared for anything. This is a picture of a couple of teams together. Um, that's me um, on second to the right. And um, I think uh, we've got the best job in the world and working for the University of Utah is like the best job ever. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna have Linda put up some polls. Um, if you guys have any questions, you don't wanna come off mute, go ahead and come off, um, you know, or set, put it in the chat and we'll let you know. But Ty, just a question. So I remember I was um, on a boating excursion um, up near like Canada, like Washington area. And the one thing they said is if you fall overboard, don't yell and scream because around here people just think you caught an awesome fish. Um, you know, is it better to have, a, like, really, they're like, they're just going to think you're fishing and you had a good time. They're like, whistle. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard that, if you've ever thought, is there one way to set, let somebody know you're injured better than another, especially if you're in a hot spot where people are going to be yelling and screaming because you're wakeboarding, you just caught an awesome break. 
you're bouncing all around on the tube or something like that. Just a question if you've ever heard anything like that. Well, wow, that's, uh, that's a tough one. I, I don't know. Um, I think the big thing is, is I, think, I think those circumstances do occur um, mm. with it. I guess if you're in that area, maybe you, know, you could. I, I can't imagine trying to whistle and, and tread water and deal with an injury if I'm hurt one way or another. I think that's a little too much uh, yeah. there. I think I would just use whatever means I could to try to communicate to the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I think that's really up to whoever is on the boat um, and everybody is responsible that if anybody falls overboard or if there's a steer that falls down, um, if things don't look right, you need to be communicating that and don't hurry, hurry back, come back. Um, that's one of the things that we see a lot too is, is, is we see water skiers get hit or we see rope burns. Um, because they're trying to, to make things really, really quick, uh, quick turnarounds and get them back up. So take your time. That boat operator needs that, that slow to 150 feet. It, it applies to the boat operator that's going to pick up their own skier too. Uh, mm-hmm. And so be careful coming in. And that's where you just got to rely on your other people to try to make that call. And I don't know. That's a tough question. I'll yeah, just say I, that. That's <laughs> I know some life jackets, like especially on those boats, they have the whistle that's on the life. Just a thought in my mind is that it might also be good if you're wearing your life jacket, which everybody's going to, even yeah. me and like Cal, right? That that's possibly something that you can think about um, as a group or as you're going boating. Is you know, do you want to attach a whistle to the life jacket, even if you have them on your boat and you're not using them? If the boat breaks down or something, you have kind of that long range something that maybe somebody could hear you. Um, but yeah, it was just an interesting thought of when they told me that they're like, yeah, they're, you're, everyone's just going to think you caught a big fish. Don't yell and scream and, and be excited. Yeah. That. In, in that circumstance, I would say a whistle, a whistle would be a great thing to have. Um, I will say in countless times, it's been dark. It's either been foggy. Uh, we've been looking for overdue fishermen, overdue duck hunters mm-hmm. and uh, things that simple little things, a simple whistle has been something that we've been able to locate them. Um, and, and it was in shallow enough water that, that we couldn't run our bigger boats with radar. So we were literally going out, running for a period of time, and then shutting down and getting quiet, trying to listen for somebody to yell or listening for sound so we could be directed in by sound only. So that's something that you can kind of look at too. So there's, there's many things. We can just kind of keep on going with, with <laughs> stories or whatever circumstances that will be helpful. And I think if everything, if we were to carry everything that everybody said that would be helpful, uh, there'd be no room for anybody to be on. But if Lisa would talk about this, um, you talked about your decision to kind of just load and go with your patients. Um, and that's something that AirMed is actually promoting right now. I know with your really short transports, um, can you just kind of tell them your guys' um, thought processes behind those things, especially with the Park City base, which is just pretty much a load and go to the, to the trauma center? Yeah. Yes. So um, the most important thing is that golden hour, you know, there's a, an hour of after a trauma period where a patient is, you know, somewhat okay. And then every minute after that, you know, their um, the chance of survival goes down. And so it's really important to get them to the appropriate facility, a trauma facility, as quickly as possible. And so, yes, we put into place, we've done a lot of studies, um, we found sometimes what people were doing were spending a lot of time on scene, um, putting in airways and doing procedures. You know, you kind of lose track of time, and before you know it, even though those are good life saving things, um, something that we didn't have at the time is that we didn't carry blood and those patients need blood. And so we can do an airway, we can do a chest tube, um, we now can give blood, but those are all things that um, they need to have and they need to have it done quickly. And so we found that we can get these patients if they are stabilized before we get there, like from the EMS, um, like with a uh, you know, backboard, and an IV, then we can just look at the patient, get a report, and just get him to the hospital because it's such a quick scene time, especially from Park City. Sometimes our halls are a little bit further out, but even still, it still kind of applies. We can do some of our procedures um, in the air. Before our thought process was, you would do all these things, you would assess, because once you're in the helicopter, you can't hear anything. You can't use your stethoscope. You, um, all you can do is like what you see and what you see on the monitor. 
And so it's so difficult to make some of these critical decisions. And, um, you know, when you're inside the helicopter, so we'd always thought, well, we'll just take care of it before we put them in the helicopter. Well, we realized that it's so important to get them to the hospital, to a trauma center as quickly as possible. And so we can do some of those things in route. Protocol is that if they are breathing, then we can um, get them in the helicopter. They may not be adequately breathing, but we can put an LMA in, we can intubate and route and to not spend the time on the ground, you know, trying to make these decisions because they just need to be at the hospital as rapidly as possible. So it's been a good thing. We're um, exciting, excited to carry blood. It just started a couple weeks ago and, and um, we're excited to be able to, you know, bring that new thing to our transport system and to the people in our community. Um, I know it's 1231, so right at the top of the hour. Definitely, I just want to give everybody a chance one more time. If you guys have any questions, please come off mute and ask or throw it in the chat. I want to invite people to join us for Trauma Grand Rounds on Thursday morning. Um, we're going to actually be talking about uh, emerging trends in EMS and trauma patients. Um, so for those of you who are EMS providers, um, that might be interesting to come. I know it's focused uh, geared towards more, um, you know, inpatient nursing, ER, ER nursing, and and uh, physicians. But you can definitely join us for that. We would get that. So if you want to be on the link to the grand rounds, email me directly. So Jamie J A M I E dot Troyer T R O Y E R, and I'll put my email in here um, at hsc.utah.edu. I definitely want to thank Ty and Lisa for taking the time out today uh, to present for us. This was a fantastic. Uh, presentation. I definitely learned some things. I had no idea that CO poisoning uh, could happen um, from the back of the boat. So that's good to know, <laughs> especially since I'll be on the water for the next week. So um, yeah, anybody, like I said, email me directly if you want any information regarding EMS grand rounds, trauma grand rounds, our continued injury prevention learning series. Um, and then again, uh, myself and Linda, our teams are working on also um, and intimate partner violence uh, year-long uh, education sessions that will be coming up too. So I'll be sending out information to the, the distribution list about that if you want to know more about that. And then in two weeks, we're doing motorcycle safety. Yes. Um, there's people just saying thank you, great presentation. So again, Ty, Lisa, everybody saying thank you in the chat if you can't see that um, awesome presentation. And we hope you guys have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hey, bye. Yeah.